Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Commit Happy Hour. Um, we've got a, a, a really fun lineup today. We've got lots of questions already. Um, and we've got Max, we've got Tom, and we've got Rhys. Uh, Tom and Rhys are going to sit on the panel, and Max has a fantastic show for you all. Um, so thanks very much, guys, for joining us. And I see we've got quite a few people. Yeah, we've got quite a few attendees already. Thanks to everybody for joining. Um, so raise a glass and um, cheers to a happy hour. So let me start the slide decks off. Okay, so what is Commit? Uh, Commit is a collaboration platform of owners, contractors, uh, solution providers and academia. Uh, Commit is a history of developing and running projects and webinars with a focus on increasing value, uh, improving productivity for better outcomes. Um, behind all te technological initiatives is, in our industry is a simple goal, and that is improving productivity, with often the best improvements coming from a combination of knowledge, people, process and technology. Commit and its community has identified with the major barriers facing our industry and has developed a unique opportunity to create enablers with the potential for beneficial change that would lead to across industry improvements. Um, I'm going to quickly nip on and explain the questions. Um, don't save the questions to the end. The panel that's on the right hand side allows you to ask the questions as you go. If you feel as though you can, then, then I'll encourage you to do that. Um, I'm sure once you see the start of the presentation, it will raise a few questions. Um, so I've got a few more slides to get through on the introduction here. I really want to very quickly just mention our new members to commit. Since the last session, Critigen have joined, Sunbelt Rentals and Navis. Um, I'm not sure there's any of those presenters or any of those members on the call today, but uh, we will get you guys to speak next time and introduce yourselves. Um, so today's session is a better understanding of digital estates using digital tools and technology. Um, this journey of discovery will help clients, contractors and academics avoid some of the digital potholes found when implementing software, especially cloud-based tools that will equip your teams to utilize visualization effectively and understand the digital estates. Max will take us through uh, and paint an optimistic picture for the future based on a current industry adoption of digital technologies whilst making light of some of the backward systems commonly found in the AC sector. Before I get on to the main presentation, I want to um, do a couple of poll questions. Now, I normally say at this point there's no curveballs, but I think potentially there are. Um, I've got four questions. Um, the first question I've got is quite a large question. You'll see why in a second. Um, I'm not able to add the whole thing in there, but what I will say, and let me ask the question now before I put it on the screen. Um, how many cloud-based systems do you personally use for work? Now, the examples don't show in the question when I put it, well, it won't show on the, on the question when I put it on the screen, but if I can tell you, if I can say cloud-based services that would include Autodesk Cloud, a construction cloud, Bentley ProjectWise, BIM 360, BIM Track, Bluebeam, Co-Construct, Coins, Dassault, FreshBooks, LinkedIn, LoadSpring, HoloBuilder, Office 365, OpenSpace, Procore, Revisto, Trimble Connect, Twitter, Zero, and I'm sure there's a lot more on there. Um, I've listed this from A to E, um, you'll see what I mean now. And I think what I'll just do, I will now launch the first question. Just bear with me a second. Okay, you should be able to see that on your screens now. So, naught to two, three to five, six to eight, 9 to 11, 12 plus. Now what I'll do is when everybody's answered this, I'll get, uh, I'll get Max to come back in. Okay. 
Okay, a couple more seconds. Nearly everybody's voted. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to close that one out and let me share that. Ooh, okay. Fascinating. Isn't it? Fascinating. I was expecting there to be a lot more cloud tools in use. Um, I wonder, if, well, I guess this is what people personally use for work. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of people in the uh, sort of between three and eight, uh, six to eight people um, or six to eight programs. That's uh, quite a lot. Um, hopefully they all talk together and all have utility um, and they're not just being used for individual tasks. But uh, three to five, that's a decent proportion there, I'd say. Um, yeah, 12 plus. There's a couple of people there, 12 plus. That's a, that's a lot. Um, it'd be interesting to know why you use so many and if uh, if maybe they have overlapping functionality. Um, yeah, was was that along the sort of lines, Stuart, that you thought you'd sort of see the breakdown? Well, knowing how many uh, systems are in use, I, I thought it'd be higher than that, to be honest. Mm. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, we've got another question that's very similar to this. And um, if you just take the word work out and put home, um, that's our next question. So just let me hide that, bring the next one in. Should be able to see that now. So these are things like uh, Disney Plus, Hulu, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Anything where you're basically you have to log into a service. I mean, even things like Hive, if you've got, say, uh, clever heating, or uh, I don't know, if you've got a Tesla, but you're a Tesla system, so you can charge your cars. Um, cloud seems to be touching more and more of our lives all the time. So it was really interesting to find out what sort of people are considered using cloud services for. Yeah, nearly everybody's voted. Thanks very much for that. Just give it another second or two. Um, okay, let me share that. Can everybody see that? Ah, that's more as expected. So uh, there's yeah. definitely more cloud usage at home than in the office. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. That's... No one uses less than two. <laughs> no, <laughs> interesting. 12 plus car. I wonder how much you're paying a month in subscription services. That That's a bit crazy. Has anybody worked that out? <laughs> I reckon well, not. If we said a five or a month on subscription services, 12 subscription services is 60 quid a month just in, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, anyway, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to vote on that. And, uh, and thanks, Max, for putting that together. Appreciate it. Uh, we do like to have a few curveballs. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got the next question here. Um, let me just raise the next one. Okay, this is to do with passwords. Which statement, you should be able to see that now, which statement best fits your use of passwords? Passwords, not passwords, passwords. Okay, can you see that? Okay, another second or two. Thanks everybody for voting on that one. Wow. Let me share that. Wow, that fills me with confidence. Yeah. I'm I'm very glad no one has put uh, I use the same passwords at work and home. Um <laughs> two years ago there were quite a few people doing that. So uh yeah, that's great. Um, several passwords, they're all based on the same one. So I'm guessing people are putting exclamation marks and pluses at the ends or capital letter at the beginning. Um, I have lots of passwords, but keep getting the wrong one. So having to reset, um, I'm guilty of that myself. 
Um, I just personally, I don't quite trust a digital password manager, but um, I'm using them more and more. Um, but it's great to see that people, the biggest group there, using digital password managers. So I'm guessing that's things like uh, Google passwords. When you go to a website, Google pops up and goes, uh, hey, do you want to use this password? And it fills it in automatically. I'm guessing that's how people are using things. So uh, that's very interesting compared to just two years ago, how it shifted. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let me just uh, hide that one out and bring in the last question. If we can. There we go. Should be able to see that now. Do you feel your data is safe? <laughs> There's something that worries me this. Hmm. Nobody said yes. Completely. Oh yes, yeah, oh yes, they have now. I wonder if they're being sarcastic. Well, maybe. Or are, or are we just completely pessimistic people, Stuart? <laughs> of course, it's construction. <laughs> no no that would be wrong realistic um okay thanks for everybody voting on that one let me share that one close that and share it um interesting interesting okay share you should be able to see that now so oh there you go oh interesting so you better define safe what do you think is safe max not sure. Well, it's a safe is different for everyone. Um, I like to know not just who has access to my data, but where physically my data is. Um, data security is, I mean, data is replicated globally these days. Um, yeah, uh, what do you feel safe? Are you do you feel safe being lost in? the cacophony of everyone else's data and uh, why would anyone look specifically at you? 4% um, of people think that uh, their data is safe because of that, but uh, yeah, that's interesting seeing those answers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks everybody for voting on that one. Um, that was nearly 100% vote. Um, thank you. Okay, let me hide that on and uh, we can get through to meeting the team. Um, so, can you see? Yeah, we should be able to see the slide now. So, meet the team. So, so we've got um, we've got Max. Thanks, Max, for putting that together. Uh, Max Malia Parfit is the director of applied technologies at Fulcro. Uh, we've got Reese Lewis, director of uh, EMA at uh, Revisto, and we've got Tom Price. And Tom is a BIM information manager and innovation lead. Uh, Tom is an independent working at. Uh, Thames Tideway on the uh, Thames Tideway Tunnel, rather, on the west section. So thanks, guys, for joining us today. Um, we've already got some good questions coming in. Thank you for that, guys. Uh, sorry, the attendees and audience, I uh, appreciate that. We had a few came in before we started, which is great, too. Um, so thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hand over to Max. Max is going to take control. He's going to show us some fantastic things that uh, he's been doing. And, uh, and then we'll have a panel session with, with um, Max, Reese, and Tom, and uh, we'll answer these questions. So thank you, Max. I'm handing over to you. Super. Um, um, are you able to put my webcam up full screen, Stuart? Just, I'll make you the presenter and it's all yours. Righto. So hopefully everyone can see my screen up full screen now. Stuart turns off his camera. I think we will. Just one second. Okay, hopefully you can now see me. Hi. Um, I'm the joys of technology. I have some buttons in front of me that let me do fun things like sticking myself up in the corner of the screen. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to press buttons and be able to show you some things. But uh, I'm going to whiz through some slides because I think it's always more interesting seeing the technology at work. Um, so, yeah, better understanding of digital estates. And you see I've put inverts around the words estates because uh, what do we mean by a digital estate? Well, this could be to an owner-operator, their physical assets, what's out on site. 
um, to a digital nomad like myself. Uh, an estate is a collection of data that's locked away somewhere that I might need to manage and uh, access. Um, but it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, just to give some history, uh, I work for Fulcro. We've been delivering construction projects in three dimensions for the last 20 years. What used to be called one source modeling became virtual design construction, became BIM back in 2016. And everyone seems to be drifting away from the, uh, the term BIM currently. Uh, but the, the whole background of Fulcro is uh, the accident and emergency services to get projects back on track around the mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems. But uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen a shift towards more design validation, verification, this whole idea of digital twins and client advisory because clients, they want to build buildings, but they don't really know how. So uh, that, that's where we're sort of jumping in and helping them along on their, uh, their digital adoption. And uh, talking of digital adoption, um, I'm sure, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, I've pulled a couple of uh, pictures from previous people's slide decks just to show what they are consider their digital ecosystems to be. So you can see a whole collection of different bits of uh, application here with some lines going between them to show loosely how they're collected. Um, again, not naming names. I've, uh, People want to try and codify and show how they're using data and how data comes together to build their, their systems and uh, how they can make it work together nicely. So you see on the left there, you've got arrows with two ends showing data can go in and out. You've got one directional arrow saying their output or just input. And then you've probably seen diagrams such as the one on the right showing how the different tools that you have in your ecosystem all joined together and how you're sharing information from one application to another and whether you're dumping everything into a common data environment and sharing this with uh, with other providers and uh, if we just bring it down to how we're going to use this on a day-to-day -day basis we've got someone working in Revit and they've got to share their Revit concept model with the structural guys who are working in Tecla what is the best format to share that data between? Are you going through IFC, CLX, or are you going sort of bypassing through SOLIDWORKS as STP or STEP? And then how do we get the data back out of Tecla into something that the next person can use? So how do we get all the trades to work effectively together um, when none of the software talks to each other and where it does talk to each other, you're quite often finding data is disappearing or you're losing bits of information um tom i don't know if you'll be able to talk about the uh, recent experiences you've got at the end but uh um data needs to be maintained data needs to be correct and there's no point losing half the data at one stage and then having to manually re-enter it further down the line which uh, seems to happen a lot but equally data needs to be in the right tool at the right time um there's no point in trying to have your fully federated building model at stage five when you so the construction stage if you haven't even detailed what's going into it you need to have that model detailed enough to do the job at hand and uh, another infographic from another company once again showing what tools they use at what stages and how they bridge the stages and uh, my personal favorite is the one on the right showing uh, this this was a graphic from Salibri actually um, showing how different bits all handshake using IFCs and Salibri files into the god of BIM and uh, well just the fun and games that that brings with it. So in practicality we've got lots of different formats, lots of different types of data all flowing into lots of different directions and ultimately what we're trying to do is build something. So what the client is wanting and what the client is seeing are these very early artist sketches of what their final project might look like. But in reality, how do we get from design intent through to construction, through to handover, when the tools that we have really aren't talking to each other effectively? So um, there's some there's the fun and games um i'm stood in front of a model here we've got a combination of a laser scan federated navis works models civils 3d doing the drainage all different formats and within the federated navis works model we've got revit mep we've got tecla structure 
uh, and a couple of different uh, ARCHICAD formats as well. And trying to get all of these formats together to work together and understand, because without that understanding, you can't make effective decisions. Uh, if I just jump into here, for example, I'm just gonna strip, strip the Tecla structure out here. You can just see the steel structure here at LOD 450. So we've got right down to all the bolts, nuts, connections, right down to the washers so we can do a quantity takeoff because that's the data that's come from the structural engineers. And uh, we can then go and have a look at, say, the drainage from Civils 3D. All of these disparate formats have to come together. And it's not just the graphical format. It's also all of the associated data. If I click on an object, I want to be able to understand what it is and the information that comes from there. Um, and people tout around IFC, Uniclass, and things like this to try and drive forward some kind of, yeah, everyone works in the same format. But um, a lot of people will have the experience that uh, IFC doesn't talk to IFC. And quite often, if you're bringing a file from one application into another, sometimes things go missing, such as geometry or data. Other times, we've even seen data transposed. So suddenly, the data that should have been in the right places is no longer there. Um, and we, we've got these challenges to try and get over. And where this really starts compounding is when we're trying to understand digital estates. So if we're wanting to get out and actually look at uh, the built environment and manage an estate, and in this case, I'm gonna use the word estate to mean something like a campus. So let's say an owner operator wants to understand their built environment. They want to understand what they're delivering and what they're going to be maintaining over the next 50, 60 years. Something like this. So uh, welcome to the University of Birmingham. This is old build the clock. Um, if you've read the Lord of the Rings, this has inspired the, uh, the, the Tower of Sauron and things. Um, but what we have here, and thank you to the University of Birmingham for sharing this, is low level massing models showing where existing buildings are that they haven't got any BIM data for. You can see more detailed models where they're in current procurement or actually just handed over the buildings. And then they've even got laser scan data. So they've drawn a load of disparate data sources together to start visualizing and understanding their digital estate. This digital estate extends beyond just the visual though. I can go into any of the buildings. So let's, uh, let's zoom in here on this building and uh, this is probably where I should have practiced things, but if I go and click on an element, you can see I've just selected this louvre, this window here in blue, but I can see all non-graphical information coming up through the CAD system. And uh, whilst it might be a little difficult to see on this screen, all of that non-graphical information which you require to make decent decisions, whether that's at a construction phase or even at an operational phase, we can start doing. So we can do a search on this model and look for all doors that need to be scheduled out or all pump units that might need to be maintained in the next three, three to six months. And this is where managing of digital estates through visualization becomes quite powerful. But how do we make this work in other tools, say a cloud environment? Not everyone has a BIM cave to stand inside. So the image there on the left, you can see that's a, a visualization from the Thames Tidewave Tunnel Project. So the engineers going in and reviewing the model data ahead of an install. On the right hand side, you can see a review session between a uh, laser, laser scan of an existing site and Navisworks model showing the federated what's going to be built. So making sure that people can see the right data at the right time is extremely powerful. And I'm hoping the audio comes through. If it doesn't, I'll mute my computer and just talk over the video. But uh, what we can see here is um, uh, some work that was done by Bentley and Microsoft. So they're working around iTwins. And this is the idea of linking real-time data from site with a digital model such that a uh, civil services team or a site management team can start having a high level view of how assets and uh, technology is working within their, uh, within their organization. So in this case, we've got a city view here and they're going to zoom in and they're going to be able to see certain assets within that city. 
And those assets can then be color coded. So in this case, they're looking at a highway and they've got the full ability to overlay the digital terrain model and the assets onto a map. So it's just running in a web browser. And then they've got some basic color coding. So green means good, yellow means there's something you might want to have a look at, and red means hang on, something's gone wrong. And with this, they can then separate it down to each of the individual structures. So in this case, they've got a vibration sensor on a bridge, so they can see uh, how that bridge is performing. They've got a tunnel there and all the associated sensors within it, so air quality, temperature, cameras within the tunnel as well, so hooking into IoT traffic cams. And this gives you the ability to then also look at roads and the, uh, the level of traffic flow within that, a vehicle counter and things. So this is where people like Highways England are starting to use real-time digital data and smart motorways to understand their assets in real time. Now, what's happening here is they're just going to sign into uh, the Azure cloud, which is where all of the live sensor data sits. And this is then going to link with that digital model and start updating it in real time. So you can see some of the colors are beginning to change. So you can see that uh, that bridge there has just turned yellow, Should could indicate that maybe there's a heavy load on it or there's an unsuitable vibration. But if we have a look at this tunnel sensors here, so just going to hover over an air quality sensor, um, carbon dioxide is at sort of 1.88 parts per million. Um, so you can see the infrastructure is healthy. What's going to happen next is we're going to actually simulate a troublesome load or an issue happening within that environment. And the whole idea around managing your digital estate is getting that high level sort of helicopter view to understand what's going on. So in this case, we're now switching to a, a bit of simulated data. Sorry, my phones are ringing at this end. I should have muted them before this started. Um, but we're now running into simulated data and suddenly you'll get an alert coming up. So you see the alerts just popped up. Something has gone out of uh, into code red. In this case, we've got a code red on a air quality sensor. So that same sensor we looked at now, the, uh, the value on that sensor has almost quadrupled in its reading, which could indicate that either there's too much traffic in the tunnel or there is a buildup. Now, the nice thing is we've got a camera there, so we're able to then go and click on that image and, ah, dig. That would explain what the issue is. So we've got a jackknife lorry within that tunnel. That's backing up the traffic, causing an increase in the carbon dioxide levels. So things that could immediately be done, increase the ventilation into that system to try and clear some of that gas out. But equally, we can then start recovering that vehicle a lot quicker. And this all comes back to how those sensors are authenticated and linked into the model, giving us that ability to understand real-time insights of a digital estate. So uh, that's, that's quite a cool use case. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to link back to uh, the full max here. So some of you may have seen this before. It's a model that I love to show. This is the entirety of the city of Helsinki. Uh, this is 156 square kilometers of city that was scanned using an aircraft flying in a grid pattern. And we're able to then bring this in sort of Google Earth on steroids. Everything in here is plus or minus 10 centimeters accuracy. We can get right down to the street level and start navigating around it. But what that allows us to do is start looking at these real-time sensor data sort of sources. So with the city of Helsinki, oh, all driven through games controller, making it very easy to navigate and use. But uh, city of Helsinki have got real-time traffic monitors on all of these intersections. The benefit of that is they can overlay real-time traffic flow, so they can start understanding how their city is performing. But going one step further, each of these intersections have traffic lights. Those traffic lights are connected through the Internet of Things to an artificial intelligence, which is being able to use to advise city ordinates how things are performing. So if they can start seeing that there is a backlog of traffic here, the artificial intelligence can start changing the phasing on the traffic light to try and reduce that congestion. If congestion gets to a position where it's no longer able to change it with traffic by routing, they can actually reroute the traffic through alternative routes. And now what the city of Helsinki are starting to do is also 
putting nitrogen oxide and air quality sensors around the city as well. And again, they can see in real time just by doing a heat map how that system is, uh, how the city is faring and if there's an increase in pollution, what mitigating factors can be taken such as rerouting traffic or actually slowing the traffic down or even speeding them up. Um, previous Comet presentation uh, about a year and a half ago um, about uh, real-time pollution sensing on vehicles and showing how different driving behaviors change different pollution. All of that research is feeding into this real-time digital model of their estate. And with that, they are able to start making informed decisions around how the, uh, the technology moves to improve the city and improve the lives for the residents. So um, better understanding of digital estates it doesn't have to be a physical estate, it could be a digital estate. It comes down to what data is correct for you and uh, how do you visualize that data? I mean, visualization could be anything from a bar chart to something like Power BI giving you a web dashboard, just as a high level overview, right through to viewing a full 3D model with live data overlay. So um, hopefully that sparks some interest. I'm looking forward to some uh, crazy questions. Um, I'm looking forward to some interesting discussion and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Max. Okay. Um, can we get Tom and Reese to rejoin? Are you there, guys? Uh, yeah, just switching everything back on. Okay. Let me um, let me take control. Okay, you should be able to see the screen again, hopefully. And let's have a look at the questions. Okay. Okay, the first question I've got, um, let, let me aim this at uh, Rhys um, from Revisto. Uh, we've got I've got one question here, which if you don't mind, um, I'll ask you first. Um, how do you as a software provider help users secure their data? And can they choose a country to host the data? And I hear this quite a lot. Um, mm. Are you comfortable with that one, Rhys? Comfortable with any question on a Friday afternoon. So um, <laughs> yes, do it. Um, and again, th thanks for having myself pleased to, to be here. Great question, and it was interesting actually seeing some of the, the poll questions being answered about this very topic. So it is a sensitive area, right? And being a cloud collaboration tool that we are, Revisto, um, we want to give our clients options. So we are a cloud collaboration tool. Uh, globally, uh, you know, we're, we're a global organization with clients and projects hosted right around the world. So we had to start uh, somewhere, and we, we had a couple of months ago five options. So you can store your data on an AWS cloud, which has got various uh, security certifications. For most of the people on this call, it would be uh, Europe, which is Dublin. We've picked up a lot of uh, new clients, um, a heck of a lot, actually. One of them that they won't mind, you probably saw this on, on various social channels, a uh, contractor called Kia. And for them, their clients, um, some of the, the, the government bodies may be on this call as well, want their data on UK soil. So for those specifically, we now have the option and that they've set up a, uh, a London-based AWS server. So your data can be in a uh, country of choice. The only limitation really is where the AWS offer that. Um, so I think we're looking to set up a few in Frankfurt. But there's also the op opportunity to store that project on a server somewhere. And Tom and I have discussed this a few times, you know, on a server down in the basement in the project office, but then only the comments and the tasks that the Max referred to it would go by the cloud. So we like to give our clients options. And yeah, then that's pretty much what they are in, in a few sentences. Okay, th thanks for that, Reese. That's, uh, yeah, much appreciated. And uh, hopefully that, that's answered the question. Um, I've got a few more questions, but please do keep the questions coming in. There's some really interesting ones here. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to ask Tom next. Um, the how do you how do you how do your teams securely access project data, and what restrictions are there to access that data? I think the interesting perspective there is what you define as my team as well. So we're um, the, uh, the lead appointed designer for the West section. And actually our supply chain is enormous and we mandate that they work within our common data environment, which is project wise. And before you actually start to secure the data, you've got to understand the workflow. So our workflow is entirely set up around BS 11 I2. Um, and obviously only when that data becomes shared is does it become visible to everybody. So once you know exactly how this workflow is broken down and how many different task groups, different companies are feeding into that, you can then start to define groups. So at the highest level in the hierarchy, that's going to be um, defined by the company you're working for. And then beneath that you're going to have to have creators checkers and approvers of that information and it's it's set up so that obviously a creator can see any information that they create within their own organization but not that information that's created by another creator in a parallel organization working on a slightly different discipline so it's been able to have enough subdivision throughout your groups so that you can define, they can see their own work in progress information, not everybody else's, but actually everybody else's becomes available to them when it reaches a certain point. So that is defined from, uh, from work in progress to internal shared for coordination. And by internal, I refer to that as internal from the lead designer's perspective, i.e. not going to client at this point. So once it moves that interim step, everybody has visibility. Um, and then shared, which is a, a formal revision, and then published, which we then pass on to the client. Now, obviously, all of that is housed within ProjectWise, which is ISO 27001 compliant. It's a secure system with a specific port and DNS address, um, which we, we provide to anybody working on the project. And then it's authentication by user account. Um, and we have full control over the user account. So when people um, are mobilized, they're added to, to that list. And when they're demobilized, they're removed from that list and that account's disabled. So it, it's, it's about security from the perspective of, of access and creation. And there's many different levels of control that we can apply to that that's totally customized based on the requirements for the task team and deliverables yeah okay well th thanks for that answer can i just ask something else on the on the back of that um yep. i mean obviously with with the project you've got there that we've just discussed or we've talked about um the connectivity to, to those various sites I, I assume that is not a problem um you, you've got thorough consistent reliable connections um, what happens if you're on a, a fairly remote project? Well, how would you deal with the connectivity there? Uh, re remote as in like no internet connectivity? Yes. Um, you can export. So ProjectWise uses a check-in, check-out feature, which is the automatic functionality. So you double click, it checks out, it downloads to your, uh, it's called the DMS area. So it's the, the managed storage. When you okay. close the software, it automatically checks back in to cloud. The alternative to that is if you know that you're going to a, a place where you're not going to have that access, you can export, which locks the file for editing for anybody else, work on it for a period of time, and then you re-import it. All the changes are tracked. There's a, a full audit trail to show who and when has, uh, has checked it out and when they've brought it back in. Um, so in, in a known instance where you have no connectivity, there is functionality to work. If, as we've all experienced through COVID, there's a, an outage in, in the area and you, you can't gain access, that's the downside to, to cloud-based systems. Unfortunately, you're not going to get the updates that, that you require, which is why the infrastructure, as, as we're all aware, is very important to make sure everybody has stable, yeah. reliable, Connectivity. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I've got I've got another question. I'll come back to that in a minute, if I may. But thanks for your thanks for your answer there, Tom. 
Um, okay, so I've got a question here that, that's coming from Anthony. Um, can you can you fly a plane or a drone over my road in Cardiff, please? Would love to track the volume of traffic cutting through. Um, <laughs> who, Rich, do you want to take that one? Because that's probably closer to home for you. <laughs> I know a man with a drone in Cardiff, um, so yeah, I'm sure they could. But yeah, it would be great actually if we could analyze what was going on. I, I think we were actually doing a, uh, a similar piece of work for Swansea University, actually, that has a building in Cardiff, but getting a drone up in the air apparently requires permission from various, uh, somebody in the council. But if that were to be granted, then I'm sure all of those pieces of data can be stitched together to, to give you some sort of answer to, to that type of question. You know, the technology is there to be used for a variety of, of reasons. So. Uh, I, but the other hat I wear outside of Rovisto is I'm a, uh, the, the Welsh chair for the UK BIM Alliance regions and within that group we have lots of discussions from various organisations and people interested in digital tools and data and there was a fascinating talk from Data Cymru that talked about use of uh, data that they got from, uh, from the Office of National Statistics for all sorts of reasons which was just fascinating. But sort of related to that question, it, it, how can we use that data to enrich our decisions and, and, and when to avoid those uh, roads, right? I didn't get the chap's name, sorry. So uh, for me, it's exactly. usually between yeah. 9, 10 and 4 and 5. So <laughs> Maybe I could put you, you and Anthony in touch. Absolutely. I was, I was just wanting to push one step further. Um, a drone, as, as Rita identified, it's, uh, it's quite a undertaking to get a drone up safely and legally um, but what we're seeing a lot more of and excuse the uh, the block of wood and the uh, the bit of drain pipe but what you've got here is a raspberry pi this is a 30 pound computer with a little webcam attached to it just in this case cable tied to a block and um, you can download open source code and such as things like vehicle counters and uh, we the reason i've got these is we're, we're doing a bit of an iot project at the moment and uh, we're strapping them to things like lampposts and it's just counting vehicles going in one direction, counting vehicles going in the other. But the other nice thing is because it's taking it from a live camera feed and we know the camera's field of view, we can estimate it or approximate the speed of the vehicle that's going through as well. So if you've ever seen them, you get those rubber tubes going across the road to check the yeah. speed of the vehicles and the councils use that a lot. Um, we've now got that, but we're, we're getting to the point where with ANPR, so automatic number plate recognition, you can start physically tracking the route of a vehicle through a city. Obviously, there's a whole GDPR argument and uh, thing to go around there. But uh, yeah, if, you, if you've got a specific um, project, I mean, uh, we, we started looking at the, uh, say, vehicle movements on site. So um, previous projects have used things like radio beacons on vehicles to make sure they're in the right place and things. But uh, yeah, um, the technology is there. And uh, the fascinating thing is these uh, 30 pound computers, they're just little Linux computers and they're so powerful and they run off a battery. So you can deploy them anywhere, connected to a solar panel and just leave them and they just stay there for the duration of a project. Fabulous, thanks for sharing that Max. Very, um, very interesting to, to hear. Um, Okay, so I've got, a, I've got another question here. Um, before I just read it out, um, please do keep the questions coming in. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I've, got one, I've got one question which, which brings us back, thanks Francis, brings us back to the outage that uh, Tom touched on. Um, so recent power outages, and I, and I believe he's referring to one, the ones in the US. Um, due to external interference raises security concerns for him with all cloud-based solutions. How good is the information that is kept or managed through digital estates? Tom, I don't even want to take that, or, or Max, do you want to take that one? Uh, Tom, do you want me to take it? Yeah, I, I, I think what I'll say before I pass it over to you is, how good is the information? Is, is that the question or how good is the security? How good is the information that's kept and managed? Well, well that's actually something that uh, Max alluded to earlier on, that the information is only good, as good as the structure in which it's created, 
from in the first instance. In terms of data integrity and authenticity, if you're not starting with a solid structure and sticking to that structure, um, if, if you allow any kind of uh, loose additions, it becomes poorer in quality as you go on. So um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure how that relates to the outages. It seems to be more of a question about data quality, but Max, I don't know if you can add anything to that. Yeah, I was just trying to actually pull up a map. Um, hang on, let's see if I can switch screens and drag a window up there. Um, so this is the current global map from AWS, which is Amazon Web Services. Um, each of the dots is a data center. And this is one of the things, and this is one of the gotchas that people have, um, especially when you're talking about how uh, and where your data is stored. So with any cloud-based solution. So AWS sits, uh, I mean, Reese, your, all of Revisto sits on top of AWS. So whilst they'll have servers in a certain territory, that data will also be replicated into at least one other location so that, God forbid, say a power outage took out New Orleans because of the current Hurricane Ida, the servers in New Orleans might go down, but at least the data can be rerouted and access through another data center. And this is actually one of the gotchas um, that people haven't realized uh, with GDPR, uh, which has been an interesting one. Uh, we've had a couple of projects where um, the client has stipulated data has to be hosted UK mainland only. And whilst we've been able to engage with the right companies, whether it's Microsoft or AWS or, uh, or others, so that they've got the data center in that locale. The question is, where is that data then replicated to for just as part of their own security? So you might choose Europe as your data store, and that will be the main data store, but there's nothing stopping them putting it over onto a server in Brisbane, Australia, or archiving off to uh, New Delhi, India. So. Um, it is an interesting question, but the benefit of that is when you've got something like a global power or a regional power outage, if you can't reach the data in a specific data center, it will just hot swap over to another one. So um, that's one of the big benefits of cloud-based systems is the resilience um, and the scalability. Scalability really is key. If you've got 50 employees and suddenly you need 500 employees accessing the data, cloud-based services have that scalability <clears throat> to enable you to do that. Um, but great question. Um, uh, the fact you raised the fact uh, about power outages, as long as you've got an internet connection and you can connect to the data elsewhere, it should be handled transparently. So as an end user, you don't see that, um, that data center go down. And then when the data center comes back up, it will just replicate the data and just it sorts itself out. And there's um, no add on to that, Max, if I can, because we yeah, get please. asked that question a lot as the, you know, the, the technology provider. And my, my short answer um, is connectivity shouldn't, affect, uh, connectivity shouldn't affect productivity, right? Um, for, for a certain amount of time, at least anyway, if, if power's out for weeks on end, then we're all in a bit of a, a muddle. So in terms of speaking with my Revista hat on here, what, what happens is once you've got that project on your device, whether that's a laptop or a tablet, then it's cached to that device, which means you can continue to work. So quite commonly, related to this question, a lot of our, our contractors are working on projects you have, Tom, where there isn't uh, internet connection, shall we say, or very limited connection. And that's uh, proved to be invaluable in those um, instances where people don't have connection where it's dropped, they've still been able to continue to work using the most up-to-date information that they've synced the last time they, they opened that project. And everything then is stored locally and then refreshed effectively when that connection is re-established. So again, yeah, great question. Whereas other tools I know are constantly streaming. And if that connection is lost, then uh, mm. uh, I'm sure we could swear now on a Friday afternoon, you're, you're, you're screwed. Um, so and you've got to wait. But anyway, <laughs> couldn't help but I think chip in there. thing to add, add to that as well is, um, in the worst case, if you can't um, gain access to that information, just a notification to, to let you know that you're not accessing the latest information, which is something that, that Project Wise does. It'll just give you a, an indicator that you're not referencing the, the latest version and the others available as a fail safe. Okay. 
Okay, so keep the questions coming in. Um, I've got uh, Anthony, thanks for this one. Um, Max, Anthony is very interested in the Raspberry Pi solution. So maybe you two can hook up on that one. Yeah, um, please. The next question I think comes off the power outages. And again, it's from Francis. Um, can it be compromised with, with reasonable effort? And that'll lead me into another question in a second, but um, compromised with, with reasonable effort. Um, okay. Um, Tom, do you want to take that one? Can you still hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that's where you, you kind of have to employ um, ethical hackers to, to attempt it, to, to, to prove the integrity of, of your system and make sure that the, the provisions that you've got in place are adequate um, in the eyes of the, uh, the professionals. It's all well and good buying a bit of software that you think is going to protect you, but you need to make sure it's it's been properly triaged. And actually, there's a need to protect the data. If you look at the ISO 19650 uh, security approach, some data, the, there is no need to go over and above in, in protecting it because it causes no loss of reputation or or damage to the, the asset that, you, uh, that you're trying to protect. Obviously, others, You've got to go one step further. It's not just digital security you need. You can you need physical security for those servers because if compromised, it, it, it could be catastrophic to um, either the asset or the the owner of um, the asset or the information. Yeah, yeah. So re reasonable approach is very important. We need to make sure we're not going well over the top. It, it just has to be adequate. And 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 that would cover accidental loss as well. Um, we, we've all seen files disappear in a, in a, in a, from a server in an office because somebody's deleted something, um, and that creates its own problems. But I'm sure, I'm sure the facilities are in place to to stop that happening, or are there? I think uh, you're talking about process there, um, and, and actual uh, personnel input. You, you've got to have things in place. It, you can't just rely on the systems to protect from absolutely everything. You can have backups which pick up previous versions from uh, a, a set time in uh, in history. But if your process is uh, uh, properly written, you can make sure your personnel aren't being so careless. Sure. Okay, I've got a I've got another question here um, from Stephen, and this is any info on data located in sensitive countries. Um, Suggestion is dipping into the data centers, e.g. nuclear power plant, um, model mirrored in, say, Far East, um, and the government taking a sneak peek <laughs> at that information. I, I think I know where you're going with this, Stephen. Uh, anybody got any thoughts on that one? It, um, it comes down to due diligence and procurement at the point of bringing that data system on in board. Um, for example, things like the Amazon AWS put certain stipulations about uh, minimum security requirements for their data center. Um, if you're just using, uh, say, your local hosting company down the road, then you're going to have less of a security capability than going into something that's got enterprise grade security. Uh, equally, some of these providers now have there are ISOs in place around data security that far outstrip anything that you'd find in PAS 1190, uh, sorry, um, ISO 119650, um, that are specifically around, say, the security of data in banking and financial institutions, the security of data that's required for level of classifications for working MOD, MOJ, nuclear. Um, and certainly, those industries have policies and procedures in place to vet companies for that data security to start with. Um, the upshot is it means if there's a widely available system such as AWS, in the case the majority of the AWS services that I interact with are the S3 services, they're the secure compute clouds. Um, as soon as a node is finished, the node is returned to the pool. No one else has access to that node. It is just gone because it's all run on top of virtualized hardware. With respect to data storage, that data is stored within secure clusters and I can define 
where it replicates that data. But um, the data is also stored in blocks, um, so VBOD blocks that, unless you know how you're going to go and uh, access them, it's just zeros and ones. You're not, it's not listing them as files like you'd find on your PC where you can go in and uh, there's a JPEG, there's a PDF. It's just a whole string of zeros and ones and it's down to the, the file system to actually understand and interpret that. So um, yeah, the, the, there is always risk and uh, certainly I probably personally uh, wouldn't want any of my data replicated in I don't know, North Korea or India, or, uh, specific parts of India or China as territories. But uh, when I click on AWS Europe only or UK only, it is down to the agreement that I have with Amazon or AWS services that that is the geographic bound that the data is going to remain in. But uh, yeah, it should be done at a procurement level and these questions should be asked before you mandate a cloud service within your organization. Sure. Okay, thanks for that, Max. Um, I've got one more question. I think we've got time for one more. I know Tom is going out at, um, at exactly at the uh, bottom of the hour, so um, well, message from Stephen. Thanks for allowed uh, to. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Stephen, for your comment there. Um, Stephen says thanks. That's perfect, um, Max. Um, okay, so the next question is from Kevin. Um, as IoT is increasingly being used, how important is end-to-end -end security from the IoT device to the cloud, and how is this done? Who wants to take that one? For Max, I think. <laughs> Go on then. Uh, boy, okay, I might actually, I might have to break out MS Paint for this one. Uh, <laughs> um, so end-to-end -end security. Um, so let's let's use uh, let's use internet banking as an example. Uh, when you have your debit card, you've got your chip, which is your unique identifier, you put it in the machine, you have to enter your PIN code to authenticate a transaction. And the way that end-to-end -end security happens is you have digital handshaking, um, very much like uh, handshaking in real world. It's a trust. Um, so you have a key, which is known to yourself which you lock your data with, so you encrypt your data. That data is then sent across. The server then attaches, it doesn't know what your key is, so it attaches its key to your data, and it sends the whole block back, and it also tells you what the key is. So you can then decrypt their data with that one-time key using your key, and then you send that decrypted information back. It's still bound up by their key, but then they get it at their end. They can decrypt it, so you get that uh, three-way handshake to decrypt data. There are ways of passing data through multiple nodes um, so that you never follow the same path through the internet twice. Uh, and then there's the world of uh, blockchain, um, whereas you have a massively distributed ledger and all of the ledgers are checking with each other for data synchronicity. So there, there are lots of ways of securing data. With IoT devices, normally an IoT device is very dumb. It's counting temperature every 30 seconds in a room. It's uh, looking at the speed something is spinning, i.e. a pump, once a minute. It's looking at harmonic vibrations on a bridge. The data is low frequency and low detail. It's not like you've got tons and tons of user information. It is a static field. Um, so that data going back to a database probably has less security wrapped around it. It would still require a password and uh, have to come in on a specific port through a firewall. So there is a degree of security there. What happens to that data after that point? That database is there and you can go and interrogate and start aggregating that data. But with respects to IoT to database, the security is minimal because, well, I've switched on a light switch. At worst, if someone was to compromise that, they could turn the light off. There is a degree of security that should stop that and prevent that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, but most sensible precautions around IoT data into databases should be set up before devices even get put onto the internet. Brilliant, thank you, Max. 
Okay, so that ends the questions. I've got a, a comment from Francis. Thanks, Francis, for tuning in. Um, Francis says, thanks all for a very insightful and valuable subject um, on a development that is growing in importance for construction organisations and individuals. Really enjoyed the session. A plus. Thank you. And um, from, from Kevin, thanks, Max. Um, I've got to wrap this up. I know, Tom, you've got to bail out now, but let me just do this very quickly. Um, moving on from the questions, I want to say thank you very much to our sponsor, O2 Business. Um, please do join the conversation. Let's raise the bar. All the webinar sessions are available online. Um, just look on the homepage. They're right there, and they're the circles that you see um, pretty much in the middle of the page. Um, follow us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, YouTube. And the next one I've got here is the next webinar is on the 17th of September. Uh, and um, it's going to be delivered by a new member rehab. And it's all about time. It's about time construction got smarter with the weather. Interesting. Talking of IoT devices. Yes, indeed. Uh, although I haven't seen any of the content yet, so yes. Um, the other thing I need to mention is the community day, the first one we've had since March 20, for obvious reasons. Um, invites are going out shortly for that. And these are the sessions for 2022. I didn't add that in there, should I should have done. So venue to be decided. Um, we'll be in touch with that. But what I would like to do is thank everybody for their participation today. Thanks to Tom. Thanks to Max for putting the session together. Thanks to Reese. Thanks to Jerry for the support, um, making it possible. And uh, thanks for all the attendees. And um, we'll see you all again next time. So thanks very much for, for joining. I didn't see any more questions come in, or did I? No, a couple more thank yous uh, from Max Eklund. Um, I mentioned Kevin. Um, yeah, great. So we'll see you all again soon. The webinar will be up as soon as it's uh, downloaded and I've uh, converted it. But uh, thanks very much and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. And we will see you on the next one. Thank you very thanks, much. Sarah. All the best. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye-bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.